Okay, good morning. Good morning. It is good to be here. You guys, you guys didn't even see me pregnant, did you? Look at this. I might have adopted. No one knows, right? No one would ever know. Um, but it is so good to be here. I'm going to start my timer because I think the greatest miracle that God could ever do in my life is for me to do a sermon that's under 45 minutes. Okay? So I am excited to be here. You know I love my Romanian family, so it's good to be here with you guys. Last time we went um, to this family's house here with Roxanne and Michelle, and we just had the best meal. We took home some honey, and it was the best. So we really feel when we are at this church like we're back in Brazil, right? We are at home, and we love it. We love it. We love you guys. Um, so I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about our NICU journey. As you see, I have two little baby boys now. So we're creating sort of a thing where mom preaches and they're front and center, and then I fast and pray that they won't cry, okay? And so um, I'm excited because I have family here and friends because when we go anywhere now, it really literally takes a village, right, with two little baby boys. But we made it on time, and happy Sabbath to you all. Okay, happy Sabbath. So we're going to get right into the message. But before we do, I know um, my friend there was passing out some papers and pens. Did everyone get those? Because we're not just going to have a sermon where we're just going to kick it back and I'm going to tell you all these pretty things and you're just going to listen. We are going to participate, okay? I want you to be active listeners. I want you to be like the Bereans. Remember the Bereans? When they would hear the word of God, they would search it, they would study it. So we're going to be the Bereans this morning. Okay, so let us pray, and then here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us this Sabbath morning together. Lord, we sang all these beautiful Romanian songs. We have no idea what it was saying, but we know it was beautiful. 
We know that it was praising you, God. And so this is how heaven is going to be. We're going to have all different languages, Lord. And I am just so, so excited to be here with my Romanian family. Um, because, Lord, whenever I come to this place, my heart is filled. I know that the Holy Spirit is here. And so, Lord, right now, hide me behind the cross of Jesus. Because it doesn't really matter what I think or what I have to say. But, Lord, use me and speak through me what you have for your people this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So everyone has their papers in hand, correct? Everyone has their, do I have a clicker or do you click there? A little clicker? Oh, there you go. That'll be perfect. So I want you to think right now, think of something in your life that went terribly wrong. Okay? Thank you. Something in your life that went terribly wrong. Write it down on your paper. No one wants to see bad news, so no one's going to look at your paper. Okay, something in your life that went terribly wrong, you write that down right there. When we have it, we'll say amen. Oh. No one wrote it down? We have it? Everyone wrote it down? Okay. So something in your life that went terribly wrong. Now, this is what we are going to work on. We're going to be discussing and researching and seeing what the Bible has to say about something in our lives when it goes terribly wrong. The first place I want you to go to is Psalm 73. Psalm 73. If you have your Bible, turn it there to Psalm 73. And we're going to read a few verses from Psalm 73. But the person who wrote it was Asaph. Now, he was a Levitical priest. He was also one of the men who created the temple choir. So this guy knew a lot of information about Christ. He was daily there doing stuff in the sanctuary and leading the people. So Asaph, a Levite priest, he knew stuff about God. But in Psalms 73, he is a little disappointed with God. And that's what I want you to turn your Bibles to right now. Okay? So verses, we're just going to read quickly. I'm going to read it very quickly, and you follow along. Verses 1 through 15, okay? Verses 1 through 15. This is Asaph's struggle. This is his doubt. He is putting it all out on the table. Scholars believe that Asaph is very upset right now because he has acquired some sort of illness, and he doesn't understand why. Something terrible has happened to him, and this is his prayer, his plea to God. So here it goes. Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as has a pure heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than their heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people were turned there and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who will always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely, look at this. Look at what he says. Have you ever felt like this? Verse 13, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. He is suffering. He is in anguish. And he's basically saying, where is God? I did all of these things in vain. I cleansed my heart and I did the right thing for what? There's another version of this same Psalm 73, the message. And it says, is God out to lunch? Is there no one tending the shop? Where is God? So this morning, something in your life that went terribly wrong, as is in the life of Asaph, he says, I am righteous, but look at what's happening to me. So this is what we are going to be discussing this morning. Look at this quote from Ellen White. Look at what she says. Many who sincerely consecrate their lives to God's service are surprised and disappointed to find themselves as never before, confronted by obstacles and beset by trials and perplexities. Has this happened to you before in your life? 
If it hasn't, you ain't living. Has this happened in your life, yes or no? Absolutely. Have there been times where, like Asaph, you are doubting and wondering where God is when you are confronted by obstacles, beset by trials and perplexity, you say, as did the children of Israel, if God is leading us, why do these things come upon us? Why do these things come upon us if God is leading? But the truth is, when terrible things go wrong in our lives, and you there have this paper in your hand of the terrible thing that went wrong, whether it was last year or the beginning of this year or a long time ago, something terrible happened in your life. But now, will this, will the things that go wrong, they can shape us or they can just leave scars? So throughout this sermon, I want you to be thinking in your mind, as you look down at your paper, what went terribly wrong, and say, has this shaped me, or has this merely left a bunch of scars in my life? For Asaph, did it shape him or leave scars? The terrible thing that happened in my life that I'm going to share with you this morning, has it shaped me, or has it left a scar just because I wanted a tattoo? And has the terrible thing in your life shaped you or merely left a scar? The next picture I'm going to show, it's probably not very pretty for you to see. My mom doesn't like this picture at all, but I'm going to show it to you. Okay, so if you don't want to see anything gory, just close your eyes, put your hands over it. Okay, put your hands over your eyes. Um, uh, one of our family, the little boy saw that, and he said, I saw that picture, and I had nightmares. <laughs> and I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to say, oh, okay. But... Saturday morning, like any other Saturday, Renee and I, I was very, very pregnant. I was 30 weeks pregnant, and my sister is here from the church that we went to preach at in Miami. And Renee is always like, that's enough. That's enough. You don't need to do one more sermon. But anytime someone calls, I say, oh, just one more sermon. And so he's like, listen, you're 30 weeks pregnant, and then that's it. This is the last sermon you'll preach. And I said, okay, okay, this is the last sermon I will preach. So early in the morning, we were pretty far from Miami. We live in West Palm Beach now. So we drove over to Miami, and there I was going to preach. And so that Saturday morning, I started to preach about Jehoshaphat, right, King Jehoshaphat. And I preached all about that. I preached a, a, a sermon on family, and then as we left that church, we headed to my husband's mother and father's house because that night we were going to go to the homeless shelter. So it was a full day. I wanted to get as much as I could in before the babies were born. But when we got to the homeless shelter, I was starting to feel a little uncomfortable, you know? So I was like, man, all day I've just been peeing myself, right? I said, what is going on with me? So I was like, okay. So I was feeling this pain. And as my husband was there singing, he sang the first song, and I sang with him. Towards the end of the second song, I was already going towards the back of the room. I said, man, I, I'm really starting to feel some pain now. We had nurses there, and they said, oh, let's step outside. So when we went outside, um, I give my brother a call, and he goes, Amanda, I think you're going into labor now. You need, you need to rush to the hospital. I said, no way. There's no way I'm going into labor. I, I'm only 30 weeks. There, I'm not going into labor. And he says, oh, I think you better go to the doctor. I think you better go to the hospital. My mom, who didn't even think we had family over, she was all the way in Orlando. I mean, no, this was not planned. We hadn't taken pregnancy photos. We hadn't gone to the hospital to get all the information. We were very unprepared. And so I called my doctor, and I said, man, now I really, I, I, I'm just peeing all over myself. And the doctor says, Amanda, you idiot, your bag burst. And so now I'm in the car, and we're driving all the way to St. Mary's Hospital, and we're 45 minutes away, okay? So Renee, you know that, that movie Fast and Furious? That was Renee, okay? On the highway, swerving inside and through the cars, and his father giving all the support, following right behind, right? So we were just going as fast as we could in that highway. I said, if we get there alive, then maybe these boys will be born today, right? So we get there. We get to the hospital because now I'm, I'm like, oh, man, I think I'm in a little bit of pain. So we get to the hospital, and the lady says, well, like, do you have your information? I said, listen, I don't have any information. I don't have anything. I don't even think I'm in labor. I think this is what they call the Braxton Hicks, right? I think I'm just, like, in a little pain. And so she says, oh, like, let me just see where you're at. So when she went to go see where I was at, I was already nine centimeters dilated. 
nine centimeters dilated, okay? And she's like, why aren't you screaming? I said, because I didn't think I was going to have these babies today, right? So here I am at the hospital, nine centimeters pregnant. And they said, man, these babies could have been born in the car. So we rush, rush over. And sure enough, that night, and here's the, the, here's the picture. Close your eyes. I'm warning you. These guys are born, right? At 819, you had a river. That's that guy to the left. And at 820, you had a reed. That's that guy to the right. But little did I know that this was going to begin what for me was something pretty terrible. Because at 30 weeks, here we were, we were excited that these babies were born, but we were going to have quite a challenge in the next few weeks and month ahead of us. But I know that my God was with us because this is how we started that night. We started that night, and the doctor says, Amanda, is, is everything okay? Are you all set? What songs do you want to play? And I said, put some hymns in the background. And there were hymns playing. And he says, is there one more thing? I said, we, you will not touch me until my husband prays. And he says, okay. And there Renee prayed and asked God that he would guide this entire process. After the nurses and the doctor said, I have never experienced a birth like I experienced your birth. Because I know that God and his angel armies was in that room. Later, we once again, this is now after birth. The boys are in the place that you're about to see. And here my father-in-law is praying and saying, Lord, please, these boys came at 30 weeks. But now I ask that you would be with them in that NICU, with them and all the other children in that NICU. But, Lord, we are ready to go to battle. We are ready to fight. And so for the next month, Every single time I wanted to see my boys, I would have to go through this door. I would go up to this door. My husband and I would walk over there. And here we would see Nick U, neonatal care unit, neonatal neonatal intensive care unit. And every time I wanted to see my little boys, this is the room I'd have to go to. And when we would get there, this is the kind of things that we would see. So you can imagine that for me, when I think of something terrible that happened to me, I think of this. Because one thing, now let me ask you mothers, and you fathers too, but you know moms were kind of like, I think that I'm a tough guy. And for everything in my life I am. But after these boys were born, man, I am just, I'm a wimp now. Right? So when I saw this, oh, that, that broke my heart. And I said, like the children of Israel, Lord, if you are leading us, then why do these things have to happen? I would go there. This is the first picture I took of my baby boys. The first picture that I took of them. I would walk in there, and you would never know, right? Because the NICU, it's like a roller coaster. You walk in there, and sometimes they're great. And you walk in there next time, and sometimes they're horrible. One time we walked in there, and they were trying to put a needle in in River Reed's arm. They barely had arms to put needles in, but they were trying. And I said, man, I said, I can't, I feel sick. I can't watch this. So I said, Renee, you stay with River, and I'm going to go to Reed because I can't see this. And when I walked over to the other one, he already had a needle sticking out of his scalp. I said, "If, if you're leading us, why all this? For the next few months, every time I wanted to do anything, This was where I would have to see my boys in their incubator. I would go there to their first diaper change was there. The first time they took a bath was there. The first time they ate was in that incubator through a tube that went right to their bellies. This was their first month of life. And all the while, like Jehoshaphat, like Psalm 73, I said, Lord, are you out to lunch? Is there not anyone in the tent? I have done everything to serve you and to love you and to do my part. Why does this have to happen? If, Lord, if anything, do it to me, but not to them. Has there been moments in your life where you have doubted the goodness of God? Where you have said, Lord, this terrible thing is happening and I don't understand why. But then look at what King Jehoshaphat not King Jehoshaphat, look at what Asaph in Psalm 73, go there to Psalm 73, go back there. Psalm 73, all of a sudden there's a change. There is something that happens in Asaph's life in the Psalms that he says in verse 16, when I thought 
how to understand this. How do I understand, God, what is going on in my life right now? And it says, it was too painful for me, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. So here, he is very jealous of the wicked because he says the wicked do all things and they're prospering. They have fat bellies. They have money in the bank. I do what is right and all these bad things are happening to me. And then he says, Lord, it was so hard for me to understand until... I went into the sanctuary. So this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how we can get into the sanctuary in order to understand the terrible things that happen into our lives. But my God, he is so faithful and he is so good that that Saturday morning when I was preaching about King Jehoshaphat, if you now will go to 2 Chronicles, go there real quick. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It says that King Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel, they were about to go out to battle with an army that was more powerful than they were, right? Second Chronicles chapter 20. And they were scared to death. They did not know if they were going to be victorious in this battle. And then if you go to verses 18, look at what it says there. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat is going to battle with an army that's mightier than him. But in verse 18, 2 Chronicles 20, 18, he says this, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping him. He was going to go to battle, and before he prayed. So I said, Lord, we are going through this story like Jehoshaphat. We're about to go through the NICU battle, and we have already prayed. Lord, what comes next? And then it says there in verses 21, that when he consulted with the chosen of God, he says, do not worry, because God is going to fight on your behalf. And so you know what they did? They started to praise and to sing. Look at what verse 21 says. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. They were about to go to war. They were about to go to battle with an army that was more powerful than they were. But they were saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. If you continue to read, again, 2 Chronicles 20, and now we are in verse 24. It says that as they were singing, God was already battling on their behalf. And so when they got all the way to the top of the mountain, praising and worshiping all the day long, that when they got there and they saw in the horizon, everyone was already dead. And the Bible says that they spent three days picking up the spoils. Because when God goes before us, he takes care of our situation. I like to say this. There are moments in our lives where we can doubt God's plans. We don't know what's going on. But when we look to the cross, we will never have reason to doubt his goodness. And this is what happened to Jehoshaphat and Israel. They were praising and singing all the day long. So like Jehoshaphat, Asaph said, It wasn't until I went into the sanctuary and there, Lord, I knew that all things were going to be okay. It was in the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary is one of my absolutely favorite things to preach about. We don't have time today to go into each and every article. Next time, maybe, I can come here and we can break down every single part of the sanctuary because it is awesome. I love it. When I do Bible study with my kids, the only thing I care about that they know, I say, you don't need to remember anything I say, but we spend almost three months sanctuary, 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 sanctuary. They know the sanctuary better than, I'm sorry to say, probably most of you know it. And these are 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys and girls. So they get the sanctuary just down pack in their mind because I believe that no matter what terrible thing happens in your life, it's when until and only when you go to the sanctuary that there you will understand. And so here, Asaph, until I entered the sanctuary of God, then I saw the whole picture. Then he understood. Five times Jehoshaphat says that his heart, his heart, his heart, now, I'm going to ask you a question. As a Levite, did he know a lot of stuff about God? Yes or no? Of course. As a Levite, did he understand the sanctuary? 
Of course. So he had intellectual knowledge. But in the sanctuary, another thing happened. He started to have a heart knowledge and a heart information. In the sanctuary, he had a personal encounter with the living God of Israel. In the sanctuary, that verse in Jeremiah, when you will seek me, you shall find me if you seek me with all your heart. If you will seek me, you will find me. But you have to seek me with all your heart. And only in the sanctuary did Asaph and did King Jehoshaphat, when they searched for God with their whole hearts, did they understand why things were happening the way in which they did. And so as I was spending time in Psalms and as I was spending time going over the story of King Jehoshaphat, I thought, Lord, thank you for preparing me Sabbath morning for what would be happening Saturday night. That's how our God works. He says, listen, you're going to go through some trying things this evening and then in the next few months, but you're going to preach a sermon on King Jehoshaphat, and I just need you to do what he did. And then you're going to read a Psalms, and I just need you to understand that it's okay to doubt. It's okay to be angry. I don't want the boys in the situation that they're in either. But Amanda, if you will seek me with your heart, you will find me. And it's only when you go into the sanctuary that things will start to make sense. And so there in the sanctuary, I came up and God helped me come up with a little acronym. And we're going to go from back to front. But before we get there, now, again, as I said, the sanctuary is a very complex thing. But all you need to know about the sanctuary right now is that in the Garden of Eden, because of sin... Because of disobedience, Adam and Eve, who once had face-to-face -face connection with God, no longer could do that. But God, in his mercy, did everything in his power to once again have face-to-face -face connection with his people. And so through the sanctuary, it was God running after the Israelites to have a relationship with them. He wanted to have a relationship with them. It says here, look, the creator of the universe, the one who made all things, lowered himself to dwell among homeless wanderers in the desert. Do you understand that? The God who made all things, the God who literally breathes out stars, humbled himself to dwell in the midst of homeless wanderers in the desert. Because he once again wanted to have face-to-face -face connection, a relationship with the people. This is what the sanctuary is all about. Not just knowing God here. Oh, I know, as Seventh-day Adventists, we know a lot of stuff. But unfortunately, it's just stuff. And stuff, when terrible things happen in our lives, will not get us through. Knowing, I know all of these, I know, to, I know how to name all of the books in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I know how many Israelites there were. I know who was married to Jacob. And I know this information, the Bible trivia, that's not going to do anything to us. But it's when we seek him with our whole hearts. There we will get to, through the terrible things that happen in our lives. And so this is the acronym that God helped me come up with. It's called NICU. So write that down on your paper, N-I-C-U. And we are going to now see if the terrible thing that happened in your life, if this has shaped you or if it has merely left scars like tattoos on your body. So we're going to go from bottom to top. Okay, the first you here in Nick U is uplift through prayer and praise. Uplift through prayer and praise. Jehoshaphat, when he was going to go after the army, the first thing he did was he gathered his family. He gathered those people and they started to praise God. They started to praise him, and they started to sing. Did you know every single time the Israelites went out to battle, the singers went first? You know the piano? That thing went first because we need to prepare our hearts for what God is about to do. So the terrible thing that happened in your life, did you uplift through prayer and praise? I'm not saying if you felt like it. I'm saying if you did it. Because when I walked into the NICU and I saw needles and wires and tubes going all over my boys, do you think I felt like praising God? Oh, I praise you, God, that my boys cannot eat on their own and they're eating through a tube. Oh, I praise you, God, that there are needles sticking out of my son's head. Do you think I? No. 
I didn't feel like praising. I didn't feel like praying, but I did it anyway. And as you do it, all of a sudden, things start to shift. All of a sudden, things become very different. So I want you to write down, what is your favorite song? What is your favorite song and what is your favorite verse? What is your favorite song and what is your favorite verse? Because right now, at this very second, we are good. Nothing bad is happening right this second. But if something were to happen in a few hours from now, you already need to be ready. And this is how you're going to be ready. Through the NICU journey, the two songs Renee and I would sing almost every day to the point that Renee said, please stop singing these songs. I'm already sick of singing it. The first one he's going to sing later today for you guys, and it's a Chris Tomlin song, and it says, Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. Because in terrible moments, you think Jesus doesn't love me, or else these things wouldn't happen. But that's why every single day I would say it multiple, multiple times a day, Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. Nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. Not because I feel love, but because I know I am loved. And the other song that we would sing is, great is thy faithfulness. Every single day, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Uplift through prayer and praise, even when you don't feel like it. Here's the next one. Oh, there's a little quote here by Bob Goff, and he says this. Check this out. The way we deal with uncertainty says a lot about whether Jesus is ahead of us leading or behind us just carrying our stuff. I love that. So the uncertainties in our lives, when we start to praise and we start to pray, God starts to lead as did the musicians. They led. And when God leads, even though we go to a place that's scary, we know that we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through it, it doesn't say I'm going to walk around it. It doesn't say I'm going to fly over it. It doesn't say that I'm not going to go through it at all. It says, even if I walk through it, you will be with me, right? And so is Jesus in your life? Is he leading you through praise and prayer? Is he leading? Or is he just like, hey, Jesus, grab my stuff? Who is Jesus in your life? Now, here's the next one, and this one's tough, okay? C, count your blessings. When terrible things are happening in our lives, sometimes we get amnesia. And we all of a sudden forget all of God's goodness in the past because our mind is so focused on our present trials and perplexities. So we seem to forget that we also had trials in the past and that God got us through it. So... N-I-C-U, the C is count your blessings. So every day when I would wake up, I didn't feel like praising in prayer, but we would do that. And I would say this to Renee. I said, Renee, we will never complain and we will never murmur. Let's get it all out of the way now. So we'd say, I can't believe this is happening. Wow, this is awful, right? Like King, like Asaph. Oh, God, where are you? Are you out to lunch? Are you not tending to us? God, this is horrible. I said, let's get it out, right? Ten minutes of complaining. Uh, then we were done. And I said, now we are not going to murmur. We are not going to complain. Lord, help us count our blessings. Is it hard? <laughs> yeah, it is so hard. But I said, Lord, help us see our blessings. Take the veil from our eyes. And God did just that. So I'm going to share with you guys small and big blessings through our NICU journey. So the first one, every morning, we would have to go to the hospital, right? So we would go to the hospital, and we would have to get a badge every single morning for over a month. It was a month and a few days. We would go to the same lady. We would get our badge. Then we could go up. After a few weeks, she says, hey, I see you guys here all the time. So we started to talk to her. I said, yeah, I have two boys in the NICU. She said, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I said, no, it's okay. They're doing great, right? They're doing awesome. <laughs> and so she says, listen, I'm going to do something for you guys. Every single morning, because I know you guys are going to come here every single day, I'm already going to print out your badges. So when you see me, you don't have to wait in that line anymore. You see me, you wave to me, and you just go right to the front of the line, and I'll give you your badge, and you can go. Count your blessings, no matter how small. I said, praise you, God, because now we don't have to wait in lines anymore. So I can get to the boys earlier every single day. We can't just praise God for the big, oh, we want big blessings. 
This is a blessing. Count your blessings. Now I'm going to share with you a big blessing. Okay, so when the boys, when I knew the boys were going to stay there, the first thing that they told me was, listen, you're only going to get three days in the hospital, and then there's nowhere else for you to stay. You're going to have to go home. But I lived about 30 minutes away from the hospital. So if I had to go there every single day, multiple times a day, because I'd had to go pump, give them milk, go back and spend time with them, I said, man, that's going to be crazy. I'm going to be driving back and forth all the time. And even if I stay all day in the hospital, like, man. And so there's this nurse, and she says, listen, there's, there's a place. It's called the Quantum House. And it's a place where people around the world, they come and stay, but it's because there is this guy, his name is Paisley, and he's a really good doctor for, what's it called? The, the, um, the limb extensions, right? So when little boys or little girls are born with a, a shorter leg, and so he does all the, the robotics sort of to get along, right? You, guess, you get what I'm saying here? Okay, and so that's what he did, and he's the specialist. So you have people coming from Israel and Austria and Russia and all over the world. You have these people coming to this guy, and they're coming to this place, and they're paying cash, and they have to stay long periods of time. She says, listen, it's almost impossible for you to get a stay there, but you can try. And I said, hey, is it impossible? And she goes, yeah, it's impossible. I said, no, 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 I need you to, like, is it so hard? Like, it would never happen. I'm not going to get in. She's like, are you, like, are you nuts? She says, yes, it's impossible. No one's ever been there. It's not going to happen. Like, I don't even know why I'm telling you. I said, awesome, because my God works when things are impossible. And so she said, like, she's like, she's lost her mind, but okay. She just had babies, right? Leave her alone. So I called and I said, hey, I gave all the information. And the lady calls me back. Someone just canceled. I'll give you a week. I said, praise God. So I went there, and I thought it was going to be just this humble little place or just the room. This thing was like top of the line. This was like a resort. They had a computer room and an exercise room. It was beautiful. And I looked at her, and I said, man, now I know why I have twins because I'm going to have to sell one to afford this place, right? It was a nice place. I said, God, man, look at this place. I, said, I, could, I could do this, right? And so... At first, we didn't think we were going to stay a month. So I said, oh, I just need a week. And then towards the end of the week, the, the nurses said, they're going to have to stay longer. And so I, w I went back to the lady. I said, hey, do you have one more week? She looked. Yeah, I have one more week. Okay, two weeks. So then another week passed by, and I went back. Do you have one more week? The entire time the boys were in the NICU, I was in the quantum house. Great is thy faithfulness. Count your blessings. And here's more. In the end, I said, man, Reed, now we're going to have to pay these people. Lord, have mercy. Right? We stayed here over a month in a nice room, like all these amenities. What are? And so she says, you know what? You don't have to pay us anything. You can just come back here, share your story. Renee can play his guitar and be with the kids, put a little time. You don't have to pay us anything. And we didn't pay anything. Over a month, almost in a few days, in the quantum center, count your blessings. So now I want you to look at your paper. And yes, I know terrible things have happened. But what is a blessing in this terrible thing? If you could think about it right now, through this terrible thing, this was a blessing. It doesn't matter how small, how medium, or large. Write it down. Count your blessings. Because sometimes it seems as though we forget. Count your blessing. Here's the next one. The next one in our time here is I, identify the needs of others. Identify the needs of others. You know, Renee and I realized that even though we were going through a terrible moment in our lives, there was someone who had it worse. I'm going to tell you some, some I hope that's good news. But no matter how bad you have it, someone else has it worse. And so I said, Lord, even in this situation, I praise you because I am still in the position to help someone else. Even in your terrible situation, you can help someone else. So I is identify the needs of others. Write it down. When Renee and I were in that quantum house, there were a lot of families from different parts of the world, so, and they didn't speak a lick of English, right? And we really took um, likings to a family from Russia. So one day I called Renee, and I said, Renee, where are you? And he says, I'm at the mall. 
And I said, someone abducted my husband because there was no way he's in the mall out of his own free will, right? He says, I'm at the mall. I said, what are you doing at the mall? He says, I'm with a friend. I said, okay, it's getting weirder and weirder, right? Ray's a kind of like to himself kind of guy. So now he's in the mall and he's with a friend. I said, Who, what friend, Renee? And he says, with my Russian friend. I said, you don't have Russian friends. And he says, and I can't understand anything that he says. I said, oh, great. You're at the mall with a Russian friend and you can't even understand one another. He says, there's this guy, and he told me that he met this guy at the quantum house, and he needed help with the cell phone, and he needed to get some clothes. And so he says, hey, I have a car. You don't have a car. Let's, let's go together. When we identify the needs of others, somehow our needs become smaller. When we identify the needs of others, we stop focusing here, and we start focusing out there, and we feel useful even in our terrible situation, and then the terrible situation doesn't feel so terrible after all. And so identify the needs of others. He went to the mall, and then we took a liking to this family, as I said, and we were sort of trying to help them journey through the quantum house, and we would go there and speak to, we're like, hey, we're, we don't want to butt into anyone's business, but can you tell us about what's going on here? We can't understand them. So we would go on Google Translate, and they would message each other through WhatsApp, right? So they would put Google Translate, it, copy and paste it, and send it. Towards the end, he had to leave his family, and his family was going to stay here much longer. He had to go back because money was running low. He was, gonna, he was not making a lot of money. And so here he was going to stay, the mother with the child, without the father, even in our terrible situation, someone has it worse. And I said, you know, Renee, praise God. And I forgot to mention and another account the blessings. Renee works at, at his job, right? He works, he has a job. He works with um, airplanes. And his, one of his managers who also had twin boys who were in the NICU, he said, you know what, Renee, I know your situation, so you can work the whole time from home. Count your blessings and identify the needs of others. He said, listen, I know we're in a tough situation, but this dad is going to have to leave. And the woman was so upset, the little girl was crying, the dad didn't want to be apart from his family. And even in our terrible situation, at least I had my husband with me all the time, every day seeing the boys from the quantum house. Identify the needs of others because... Lord, have mercy, God, use me even in my tough times to be a light to someone else. So that when people look at me and say, man, you're going through a tough time, what is the reason for this? And your life will be the reason for people to glory in Jesus Christ. Identify the needs of others. So we're coming, we're slowly coming to a close here. But with identify the needs of others, I want us to look at what Jesus Look at here what Ellen White says. As the eyes of Jesus wandered over the multitude about him, one figure arrested his attention. This is Jesus on the cross. At the foot of the cross stood his mother, supported by the disciple John. In his dying hour, Christ remembered his mother. Even in terrible agony and pain, Christ looked for and identified the needs of someone else. Look at what she says. Oh, pitiful, loving Savior. Amid all his physical pain and mental anguish, he had a thoughtful care for his mother. We need to be like Jesus. And then it continues. Now what? What is the end? The final, final acronym, the letter N, is now is the best time. Write it down. Now is the best time. Human beings, we have these things where we say this. I will be happy when fill in the blank. I will be happy when I get that job. I will be happy when I finish that school. I will be happy when my husband starts loving me. I will be happy when I have kids. I will be happy when my kids go to college. I will be happy when. Have you done this before? Are you waiting for reasons to be happy? And are you putting your happiness on other people? If this person did this or if this person did that, then I would be happy. Let me tell you something. Your happiness is in your control, and there is no one else responsible for your happiness but you. Now is the best time. I will be happy when fill in the blank. What if that thing never comes? Or here's the worst part. It will come, and then you're going to realize, I'm not happy. And then you're going to try to go after the next best thing, and you're going to spend the rest of your life running around like a chicken with its head cut off, trying to find the thing that makes you happy. 
But I'm here to tell you this morning that no matter your situation, how terrible it is, no matter if I will be happy when that blank is not yet filled, now is the time. Right now, right here, get in the sanctuary because now is the time. I want to share with you a little bit about one of my favorite characters in the Bible, and that's Paul. Remember, Paul and Silas, they were preaching all over the place, and multiple times they went to jail, right, they went to prison. And, man, they got messed up and busted up in prison. Look at what Ellen White says. The apostles suffered extreme torture because of the painful position in which they were left, right? Heads locked up, arms locked up by other prisoners. But they did not murmur. Paul could have said, God, when you get me out of prison, I will then preach your holy Just get me out of here. But Paul understood that now was the time. And look at this. Instead, in the utter darkness and desolation of the jungle, they encouraged each other by words of prayer and saying praises to God. Because look at this. They found, they were found worthy to suffer shame for his sake. Look at Paul. Look at what he does. With astonishment, the other prisoners heard the sound of prayer and singing Ishui from the inner prison. They had been accustomed to hearing shrieks and moans and cursing, swearing, breaking the silence of the night. But never before had they heard words of prayer and praise ascending from the gloomy cell. Paul didn't say, I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to pray when I get out of here, Lord. So just deliver me in a mighty way and perform a miracle. No. He says, even here, now is the time. Guards and prisoners look marveled and ask themselves, who these men could be who cold, hungry, and tortured could yet rejoice. So when I read this, you know what I know? Happiness does not depend on your circumstance or on other people. It's on yourself. It's a matter of the heart because all these situations, cold, hungry, tortured, why were these men rejoicing? Because they were in the sanctuary. Now, Paul and Silas, in such a mighty way, when that prisoner who, right, the doors were open, that prisoner, he was about to, to kill himself because he knew if he didn't, someone else would. Paul says, no, 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 don't kill yourself. And he says, what do I have to do to be saved? He said, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible tells us that he and all of his family were saved. Now is the time. When you look at your situation, Lord, why is this happening to me? It's, Lord. In this situation, how can I identify the needs of someone else? Because now is the time. So now Renee's going to come up here and he's going to get ready to sing a song here for us. And I want to put one more Ellen White quote because sometimes when we say, I will be happy when, in this sentence comes a lot of grief because of what people have done to us. Paul and Silas, were they mistreated in prison, yes or no? Yeah. They were so mistreated that the next place that they went to preach, they had so much bruises on their face that they had to explain what happened because people were looking at them like, where'd you guys go? Now look at what Ellen White says. The severity which which the jailer had treated the apostles had not aroused their resentment. Paul and Silas had the spirit of Christ, not the spirit of revenge. Their hearts filled with the love of the Savior had no room for malice against their persecutors. I will be happy when this person asks me for forgiveness. I will be happy when. So I want you to think right now as Renee is singing this song, we just have a few more slides to get through. And I'm going to leave this one up here for you. Things that go wrong can shape us or just leave scars. As you listen to this song and think of the terrible thing in your life, I want you to count your blessings. I want you to identify the needs of others. And I need you to understand this morning that now is the time. I will be happy when does not exist in the Christian life because in this world we will have many troubles. But fear not, because like King Jehoshaphat, our God fights before us. And the reason we can go through uncertainties is because our God is before us. He's not just in our back carrying our stuff. He's the God of the sanctuary. So prayerfully, now I want you to meditate on Renee's song.
but I want your mind to be lifted up and I want you to say, Lord, show me where in NICU, where in this acronym have I been failing? Lord, right now I'm, I'm angry. I'm like Asaph. I don't know where you are. You are silent. Do you not hear? Are you deaf? But Lord, today I want to get into the sanctuary with you as quickly and as fast as possible. So let's hear this song. Thank you. 
Now, I'm not saying that this is something easy to do. I'm not saying it's hoorah, let's go to the NICU and it's going to be so easy and we're just going to count our blessings and we're, it's going to, no, this is something supernatural. There are moments that I doubted, there are moments that I cried, there are moments that I was angry, but I realized that when you get into the sanctuary, this is what happens. Psalms 73 takes us beyond the present life into an eternity of glory where man will find the ultimate solution and his ultimate satisfaction in the presence of God. So the sanctuary is that. It's the presence of the living God. And there you can go through terrible things, but these terrible things, the messes in your life will become, look, it'll become your message. Because I can look here and I can see my two little boys. Yesterday we went to the pediatrics and she says, the boys are perfect because God is faithful. And even through the trying moments, we can't just rejoice when things are good. We got to rejoice when things are not good we got to rejoice every step of the way. So it isn't until, and only until, until I went into the sanctuary. This is what NICU is all about. NICU is about you getting into the sanctuary and uplifting through prayer and praise. Count your blessings. Identify the needs of others. And don't wait. Don't hesitate. Now is the time. Stop with this thing. Oh, it's because I didn't have a father figure. Oh, it was because my mom was so mean. I never heard I love you from my parents. So that's why I don't say I love you. Let me tell you, yeah, that sucks. I'm sorry if you didn't hear I love you. But how long are we going to hang on to that stuff? We got to move on. Now is the time. The things that happened in your past, the mean things people did to you, the husband who cheated you, the pastor who was rude to you. That's it. Say, Lord, I'm going to complain and I'm going to mope like Asaph. Where were you? Look, look at the wicked. He doesn't even care about you, God, and look at his house. God, he curses your name and look at his car. We need to stop being jealous of the wicked, but you can complain and you can murmur and you can doubt. Let me tell you something. Our God is big enough for those things. Our God is not going to get upset if you pray and you cry and you're angry. He can take it. He's a big boy. But all I'm saying is after you do that, get into the sanctuary and follow NICU. So you can do all those things, but then now is the time. Let's go. Now is the time. So that's my prayer for you all this morning. And always remember, as Renee just saying, nobody loves you like Jesus loves you. Even when it feels like he doesn't, hang on to the promise that he does. Why? Because the word of God says he does. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, man, a lot of stuff we talked about this morning. Lord, we saw that King Jehoshaphat, when he was scared, he prayed. And there's a part in Second Chronicles where he says, I don't know what is going on, but my eyes are fixed on you. Which leads us to believe that there are times that we can doubt your plans. But Lord, when we look to the cross, when we look to the sanctuary, we will never have reason to doubt your goodness. Oh, Lord God, there are terrible things that have happened in our lives. And unfortunately, here's the reality. There are terrible things that will happen in our lives. And Lord, like Asaph in the Psalms, sometimes we look at the wicked and we look at people who are the ones doing the terrible things and we say, how are they better off? How is it that they do all these horrible and terrible things and why do they prosper? Like Asaph, we say, Lord, are you out to lunch? Can you not see? Do you not have ears that hear and eyes that see what in the world is going on? And, Lord, we almost, at moments in our lives, we almost wish that we had someone else's life. But, Lord, this man, he took a turn. There was something that happened when he went into the sanctuary. And when he went into the sanctuary, he realized your goodness. He realized who you were, and he no longer compared himself to other people. In the sanctuary... He could uplift in prayer and praise. In the sanctuary, he was able to identify the needs of others. In the sanctuary, he counted his blessings. And in the sanctuary, he realized that now is the time. So, Lord, give us the same assurance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Sorry, guys. One more thing here that I forgot to, to read, but I think it's very important. But I also want you to read this at your home on your own time. In Psalm 73, I just want to read this last verse because it says something so beautiful. Look at what it says. After there's that switch in verse 17. In verse 21, it says, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Look, you hold me by your right hand, and you guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Who have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever and the last two verses and this is what you're going to take home for indeed those who are far from you shall perish he understood the end of the wicked you have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry but it is good for me to draw near to god it is good to me to go into the sanctuary and be face to face with the living god why because there i have put my trust in the lord god that i may declare your works through my terrible experience, I will use this mess and change it to my message. God bless you guys.